The Untold Truth About the 2000 NBA Draft Class Some experts have called the 2000 NBA Draft Class the absolute worst of any era. There is no question that it was pretty darn bad. But is that an overstatement? We will delve into this group and examine two central questions. How bad was the 2000 NBA Draft Class really? And why did they perform so poorly? Draft classes vary wildly in quality, but they all have their share of excellent players and busts. But while the 2000 NBA draft class had no shortage of busts, they were very much short on top-notch players. For example, all the players selected managed only three cumulative all-star appearances, less than any other class from 1980 and onwards. Indeed, only one other class had a single-digit number. Compare that to the storied 1996 NBA Draft class, which had 10 All-Star players, amassing 64 All-Star selections. But it's not just that this class failed to create a single NBA superstar. The 2000 selections had trouble putting together lengthy and credible professional careers. But even that doesn't truly capture the horror of this rookie class. One of the most useful advanced stats for NBA analysis is the warp. Wins above replacement player metric. It measures how well a player would do in a team of four other average players, as opposed to how that team would do if they had an utterly average player as a replacement. The 2000 draft class performs remarkably poorly in this metric. As a group, they tallied 17.3 fewer wins than an average group of NBA players. In other words, that group made the NBA player pool significantly worse than it was before. The basics of statistical probability suggest that when you have dozens of rookies classes, there will be ones far better than average and others far worse. So really, it is no surprise that there is an absolute stinker among the draft classes. But ultimately, a draft class is just a collection of individuals. Each has its unique story and circumstances. So let's look at some of the most spectacular 2000 NBA draft class busts and figure out what went wrong. Stromile Swift, Vancouver Grizzlies, second overall pick. Swift is one of those names you routinely see among the biggest busts in NBA history. And of course, that means there were great expectations for him. Stromile was a McDonald's All-American and evolved into the main force behind the LSU Tigers' drive to the Sweet 16 in his sophomore year. And if you watch tape from those college years, you can see what the fuss was about. Swift wasn't just a top-notch athlete. He had tremendous footwork that already looked NBA-ready. However, mentally he was clearly not prepared for the pros. The forward stood for the draft after two years in college. In retrospect, that appears to have been a severe mistake. Nonetheless, after a shaky rookie season, the young player appeared to find footing in the 2001-02 season. Admittedly, Swift had a longer pro career than most of his 2000 colleagues, with 11 seasons in the league. But much of his longevity came down to teams hoping he would rediscover the capabilities that made Stromile such a rated prospect. But ultimately, the big man averaged just 8 points and 2 rebounds over his long career. Darius Miles, Los Angeles Clippers, 3rd overall pick In the case of Darius Miles, the explanation for his NBA career failure is pretty straightforward. He seems to have been a victim of moving directly from high school into the pros. Darius was one of the most athletically gifted players of his generation. His highlights taped from the St. Louis high schools Miles attended were absolutely epic. But the raw athletic talent of that caliber isn't enough. When Miles looked back on his career, he noted that the lack of a father figure was significant in his suboptimal development. The Clippers pick said his father wasn't really in my life, so his bus-driving mom raised the youngster as a disadvantaged single mother. College isn't just where young players learn the fundamentals of the game. However, that is an essential part of the process. It is also where coaches provide talented but troubled teens like Darius with guidance. But Miles went right into the pros without having the right skill set or the emotional mindset necessary for success. 
As a result, he was involved in some needless controversies. Like when he said to coach Maurice Cheeks, I don't care if the team were to lose the next 20 games, because the coach was going to be fired anyway. Miles became a flawed player who put together a decent enough career. Sadly, just as he seemed to find his groove with the Trailblazers, an injury cut the player's career short. He averaged 14 points and 4.6 rebounds in the 2005-06 season. The following year, the small forward's numbers collapsed to three points a game, and he soon retired. Not long after that, Darius was broke, despite earning $61.9 million throughout his career. Most remarkably, making a healthy $9 million from the Portland Trailblazers in his last season for the team. There is no question that this was a case of too much for Miles too soon. Kenyon Martin, New Jersey Nets, first overall pick. Not every player in the 2000 NBA draft was a terrible disappointment. To be sure, Kenyon Martin is not remembered as one of the tremendous draft-topping selections. However, he doesn't make those worst number one draft picks ever lists. Not even close. In 1999-2000, Martin was the best college player in the nation for the Cincinnati Bearcats. He averaged 18.9 points, 9.7 rebounds, and put up a fabulous 3.5 blocks a game. Not surprisingly, he was unanimously chosen as National Player of the Year. But sadly, he missed the NCAA tournament with a broken leg. Nevertheless, he maintains the school record for block shots with 292 and the highest field goal percentage. Reaching the NBA did not slow the player down. He made the NBA All-Rookie Team in 2001, and, by his third season, was a legitimate star for the Nets. The truth is, Kenyon was an absolute defensive beast. The player was on track to a remarkable career before injuries cut it short, and those of us who saw him play remember his unforgettable presence. He did everything with attitude and a lot of brutal force. Whether it was the flashy dunks, the forceful blocks, or the trash talking. Martin was an incredibly effective two-way player at his peak for the Nets. In 2003-04, he scored 16.7 points and took down 9.5 rebounds per game, 2.5 assists while offering a peerless defense. That is just great basketball. Kenyon's specialty was a unique steal and block combo. First, he would wait for the player to begin the shooting motion by giving them some space. Then the power forward would pounce when their shooting motion was at its apex. Finally, Martin would cleanly block and gather the ball into his hands, starting what was usually a lethal transition move. It was poetry, but his personality was always abrasive, and that sometimes got in the way of Martin's success. For example, he got into a fight with his teammate, the legendary Alonzo Mourning. During Kenyon's time with New Jersey, they reached two NBA Finals in a row, but lost them both. So, the Nets brought in Mourning as reinforcement to finally get that ring. But the two stars did not get along. Alonzo criticized Kenyon in an interview for being injured too often. The center said, which isn't cool. But Martin responded by mocking Morton's life-threatening kidney condition, saying, My kidney, my kidney. They came close to blows on more than one occasion. And Martin said, There weren't any punches thrown. When he got mad and acted like he wanted to do something, I told them to let him go. I've seen your fight with Larry Johnson. I'll wear you out here. With that sort of attitude, it is easy to see why the Nets in this era did not win a title, despite their talent. In 2004, Martin was traded to the Denver Nuggets, where he played well at first. But two problems emerged. First, a disciplinarian problem with coach George Carl. Martin wasn't getting enough minutes for his liking, so he refused to play when asked to. In his memoir, Carl wrote, Kenyon and Carmelo carried two big burdens, all that money and no father to show them how to act like a man. That statement is pretty condescending, though not necessarily untrue. Kenyon responded, I didn't have a father growing up. We all know that. What's George Carl's excuse for being a terrible person? 
but Kenyon's knee issues were much worse than his problems with Carl. He underwent his first knee surgery in 2005, a microfracture surgery on the left side. But as sometimes happens, Kenyon overcompensated on his right leg. Soon, swelling occurred there, and he had to undergo microfracture surgery on the other side. An absolute nightmare. It was the first time an NBA player underwent surgery on both knees. The player bravely underwent rehabilitation and returned to the court. He even remained an effective player. But Martin would never again be the dominant force he once was. Will we ever see a draft class as bad as 2000 again? What can we learn from this horrific draft class? Very little, to be honest. There was no shortage of talent in the 2000 NBA draft class, just like every other class in history. But a lot of unpredictable things went wrong. In retrospect, it's easy to look back on a failed career and say it was inevitable. But so much success is random. Finding the right coach at the right time having chemistry with teammates, and of course, avoiding injury. However, there are some things we can learn from the spectacular failures of Stromile Swift and Darius Miles. The two players were precocious and raw talents who clearly went into the draft too early. Miles skipped college and went straight to the pros. For every Kobe and LeBron, there are dozens of players who really need that time to improve their fundamentals and mentality. Swift went into the draft as a sophomore. Both appear to have been far from the required mental maturity needed for the NBA. Number 4 pick Marcus Pfizer also declared for the draft after his junior year and could have benefited from more collegiate time. All this shows that we never know what challenges players will face in the pros, but college and good coaching may help prospects prepare for those challenges.